Welcome to Limitless, the Blind Beginnings podcast where we discuss tips, tricks, and current topics related to all things in the blind and partially sighted community. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce the founder of Blind Beginnings and your host, Sean Marcellet, and whatever co-host is on this week. Now, here's your host, Sean. Welcome back to Limitless, the Blind Beginnings podcast. I'm your host, Sean Marcellet, and I have two co-hosts today, Randy and Nika. Welcome back, guys. Hello. Uh, Today, we're talking about music and music lessons specifically, or learning an instrument or learning music. This is a question that I've been asked frequently by parents who are raising kids that are blind or partially sighted. How, you know, who do you recommend to teach my child how to play the piano or... Uh, it's you it's very often the piano and so we thought we'd talk about that today and Randy suggested a really awesome guest who could shed some light on the subject so why don't you tell our listeners who our guest is today Randy thanks Sean uh well everyone interestingly enough I come from a little bit of a musical background and today we have my mom joining us Lori Fry welcome Lori thank you very much so why did you think Lori should join us in this particular instance, Randy? So I thought it would be an interesting perspective um, for a couple of reasons, and mm-hmm. not in any particular order, but just that um, you would put out a call out to amongst our podcast committee here that, you know, for suggestions of uh, people to talk to. And I thought maybe it'd be an interesting perspective because she grew up legally blind. Uh, My mom has never had, you know, more than legally blind, which for anyone who doesn't know is 10% or less of what everyone considers normal vision. And, um, you know, took several years of piano. I'm not exactly sure how many, but I'm sure she'll be able to talk about it, including the Royal Conservatory of Canada. I remember growing up with several certificates on the wall and the piano in the living room and listening to my mom play a lot uh, when I was younger. Uh, And I really enjoyed that. And uh, I mean, I still enjoy that, but I'm not home very often to get to hear it. Um, Additionally, she learned using large sheet music. So like it was a regular sheet music on a very large scale, which I'm sure we'll also talk about later. And as 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 a child, I thought it was... I don't know, just the funniest thing. Basically, it was at certain ages, it was taller than I was. <laughs> and then also just that, um, well, once she grew up and had kids, there's my brother and I, my older brother is a couple years older than me. And she taught both of us the, at least the basics. Uh, I'm not sure what uh, course we were using, but we all, we both had to get through the first theory book entirely. Um, we had to practice. I'm not exactly sure how often it was, but it was probably like you know, a little bit every day for a while. You know, this was for me, this was around kindergarten age, so about four, five, six. And then, you know, later in life, when I ended up joining the band class in, you know, and elementary school, middle school, and high school, having that being able to read music already was really helpful, uh, even though I didn't at the time, you know, appreciate the practice and the teaching as a child. You have to practice. I don't want to. <laughs> Yeah, Lori, um, before we go deeper into all of that, can you first of all describe a little bit what level of vision you have? Absolutely, yes. Um, and, and speaking of currently, uh, uh, I'll just reflect on something Randy said first is yes, my entire life, I was, I was born with a genetic condition that affected the retinas and therefore I did have low vision all my life. or less, as Randy mentioned, uh, leading me to where I am today as an older person um, with approximately 1% vision in one eye and no sight in the other. So it's very, very, very close to to total blindness. Okay. So um, maybe before we ask you more about your learning music, I'll just go over to Nika to tell us about your sort of interest in being part of the discussion today and and music in general. Yeah, so music has always been a really, really, really big part of my life. I love it more than anything. I've been playing piano for 12 years, 
um, and vocal lessons for eight years, including like RCM and conservatory. And then I did a lot of choir in high school and like studied music for a year in university. And now during the pandemic, I'm trying to teach myself guitar and ukulele. And it's something really important just because it makes up a really big component of my identity and who I am as a person. And it's kind of my way of self-expression. I love writing music. I love music theory. It's a great creative outlet for me. Yeah, I can relate. I was really big into music when I was kind of growing up, took piano all the way through, did my, I did all the Royal Conservatory all the way up to grade 10, but I actually, I can't believe I'm going to admit this on a podcast, but I failed my grade 10 <laughs> exam and I never went back to redo it. Um, but then I was really super active in the school band. I played the flute in the concert band. I played the trumpet in the jazz band. I sang in the jazz choir, learned the trombone one summer just for kicks um, and took some guitar lessons as an adult that never really got me anywhere because I never practiced. So <laughs> but wow, yeah. that's, a, that's a lot more than I knew you had uh, dabbled in. <laughs> I know, I, like music was my thing. Uh, you know, through high school, I collected everything musical, like musical, I don't know, ornaments and vases. And... Yes, memorabilia. Yes. I even bought a musical note mask because I'm so nerdy. Oh, like, that's like, so cool. For graduation, I decorated my like grad cap with music note stickers. Yeah, that that's, I was big, big, big into music. And then I became an athlete and it was kind of like, I don't know how to do both at the same time, I guess. <laughs> you went from band geek to jock. Totally. Very strangely, like at 18, started to do sports, which is way late to the game, but that's a whole other podcast. Um, so what about you, Lori? You, we know you played piano. How did that all start and how far did you go with it? And Well, I'll tell you, but now I'm a little embarrassed listening to your background and Nika's background <laughs> thinking, I don't know if I'm in the right league here. Yes, you are. <laughs> at least you can play with both hands on a regular basis. I've got like one song under my belt with two hands and that's it. <laughs> but then okay. I also played the flute in high school, so. Yes. Um, so like you, um, both of you, Nika, Nika and uh, Sean, you both referred to the Royal Conservatory of Music. And yes, that's where um, I was led at age six. Um, oh, wow. for, full ten year, for full 10 years, I did the Royal Conservatory of Music. And yes, Randy, there are some certificates from the Royal Conservatory of Music, the University of Toronto on the wall. And for Sean's sake, don't be embarrassed. You made it to grade 10. I did not. <laughs> I um, successfully completed my grade six exam and received um, uh, a certificate in that. I was preparing for my grade eight Royal Conservatory exam when I fell into a second detached retina. And because I was totally a, a, a music reader. Uh, I did not have that natural ear for music. And so at age, after my second attachment at age 16, um, playing became really a challenge with the vision. And, and yet there was a combination of things at that point. I'm 16 years old. I'm working a part-time job. I'm quite academically inclined. I'm already at, I had um, also done uh, some theory. I had taken on my rudiments one and two, and I went into music, uh, history, and harmony. But I was told at that age, it was a pretty much a first-year university course. And I really was kind of bogged down and was missing out a bit of friends. So at that point in time, I sort of hung up the music um, you know, career um, and, and yet sort of thought, yeah, there's, there's something I can always go back to. So um, I did receive honors and first class honors in my rudiments one and two exams with the Royal Conservatories. And as Nika pointed out, I found theory very exciting, unlike my children. Uh, yeah, we did not. I, I did not <laughs> enjoy the theory so much. But, you know, it's interesting. I was talking about I became a became a jock at 18. I also lost the ability to see, like to read print and read music at that age. So I'm sure there was a connection there too. And like you, like I learned pieces by reading music, literally one bar at a time, and I couldn't see while I played. So I had to sort of memorize 
but yeah, once that was taken away, it was like, I don't really know how to learn anything new. So I still, I don't want to say how many years later can play the same songs I was playing <laughs> at 18. Some of the ones that were my favorites, but I haven't learned John, anything new. That's kind of where I am now. And Randy talks mentioned actually, you know, hearing me play when they, the kids were younger and I, I've played less and less and less. And when I do go to the piano, like I'm still picking back. Yeah. the Maybe the eight songs, I know a few Christmas carols, you know, yeah. things from way, way back. That's what I'm playing as well. And yet I was really good at reading the music. I, I was very good at that, but I I'm lost without it. So you never learned how to read Braille music after the fact kind of. No, I did not. And I didn't even take Braille till I was um, actually a, a mother. Um, and I packed my Braille courses around all the dance lessons and soccer <laughs> practices with my kids and sat in the stands and practiced one handed. But um, backing it up a little, though, I um, when I did get to a point of, of real difficulty, I think it started out for me as you'd sit down at the piano and you'd lean forward, which certainly impacted your your posture and your hand positioning. But you would lean forward enough to read it, as you say, memorize it. Then you could sit back and, and, and play it. But it's interesting for those out there that aren't familiar with vision loss. I mean, we learn a lot of tricks of the trade. And the one thing that I could do, and, and I'm sure many others can as well, um, is you'd learn that piece of music and you could sit completely back. And even if you didn't memorize the whole thing by heart, as long as you could follow the shapes and the, you know, the, the, the crescendos and the, you know, decrescendos and, and on all the, the, the different um, music symbols and, and you, you could follow along. And um, that got me by for a long time. And then at one point and many, many years ago, Sean, you may remember this, um, but the, um, CNIB uh, library had a music department and this goes back like I said to the 70s um, not that I'm going to date myself but <laughs> back, back in the 70s um, I did have the opportunity to have some of my sheet music enlarged as Randy mentioned and it was incredibly large I mean the sheets I don't know any photocopier anywhere that makes it was like three feet by two feet poster, poster size okay. wow. and so at the time again they were they, they enlarged my grade eight royal conservatory pieces that i had been working on for a year and a half i worked on the same five pieces for a year and a half was about to go for exams in june and ended up with eye surgery in march and mm. um, that's sort of like i said where it sort of stopped but again that sheet music though got me through for quite a bit longer after that um, but again it's so large that eventually you're still leaning in mm -hmm. and, and at some point you almost have to stand up to read the top measures you right know? wow so but that was a really valuable um resource so as simple as it was really large sheet music and uh, somebody even asked me, well, how would you turn the page? Oh, you learn. You just would flip quick, you know. <laughs> uh, you, you, Hope it doesn't you know, hit you, you in the face on the way by. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what I ended up doing is getting a major clip and a big sturdy piece of cardboard and then laying this sheet music you get, you know, on the cardboard, clip it to the top, and then that would stand up you know, on the piano where your music book would go normally. Wow. Now picture that, a three foot tall, because it's not a landscape, it's portrait too. So it's three feet tall. Yes. Yeah. on top of a like stand-up piano yeah <laughs> so it's it's like two or three it's about two feet over the piano if you're looking at it from the back of the of the instrument <laughs> wow yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And, but like um, i said it was a wonderful service and i i and i i it does not hasn't existed there for a long time oh that's too bad that is yeah. one of the questions i get from parents with kids with visual impairments is just like is there something to bring the book closer to your face or, and it seems like everyone goes to bring it to Staples and get it enlarged it seems to be the, the go-to response. And I don't know if you know of anything, any device that kind of like holds your book closer to you. You just triggered something from a memory from long ago. Um, <laughs> I believe, I think my parents started with, not initially, not at six years old, um, but later on, um, you know, a few years down, in fact, I often describe this as I didn't even like playing the piano until about the fifth year. And um, I later learned out why I was chosen to, to take piano lessons. And um, we, we can address that that later. But uh, 
I, I can kind of recall now that you said that, Sean, that there was a device, a wooden device attached to the back of the piano that came across the top of the piano so it would end up in front of you right where your books were going to go. And similar to what I have now for my computer monitor, where it's, it's basically an arm that can bring it closer to your face rather than you leaning in. Hmm. So yes, even way back, there was probably some cumbersome type of invention, a big wooden cumbersome thing that would clamp to the back of the piano and had this arm and a, and a stand like you would for normally like a, an orchestra type when you have a stand. I'm yeah. Sorry, I don't know the terminology for the music stand that goes in front of you, Randy, when you play a flute. Music stand. So, <laughs> okay, <laughs> there you go. Music stand or ask Mika. She's in a lot more schooling for this than I ever did. I just thought maybe times have changed and got more modern. Maybe there was something more. I don't think so. I mean, there might be. <laughs> okay. I don't know. So, um, yeah. Nika, do you so read that music? I would... um, so, yeah, I do read music. I read Braille music because when I started piano, my teacher was actually fully blind. And when we first started, she would record my songs and actually say what note she was playing. And then later on would actually use the Braille alphabet and write like A, B, C, D. And then later on, she taught me Braille music. And I remember I did not always like theory. I hated it when I first started it. I, every time would get exercises, I would start moaning and groaning and whining. <laughs> I did not like doing theory exercises at all. And something that I kind of came to realize is that I don't like learning piano with braille music. I prefer learning vocals with braille music just because I'm actually able to sing and read the music at the same time simultaneously. Yeah, that was gonna be my question. So when you're playing the piano, reading braille music, it would be like it was for me. You'd have to just look at what you can see and remember and then sit back and play it. And then- Yeah, or it would yeah. be the play the right hand while reading with, with your left hand and then play the left hand part while reading it with your right hand. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. I don't know. I loved learn doing it with vocals just because like my RCM exams were for voice, not piano. And it was easier to get advanced music kind of made for me in Braille music instead of just memorizing it. Or even in high school when I was in a lot of different choirs, the music kind of got um, overloaded me and I felt overwhelmed. So actually being able to read music like everyone else instead of just keeping all of it in my brain was really helpful. Yeah. Did ha, have you had a problem getting your music in Braille? Um, actually, no, because in high school, PRCBI would send it to someone who was on contract um, in Alberta and he would make it for me. OK. Um, in university, it's kind of a bit harder just because, you know, PRCBI isn't really a thing anymore. And for uninitiated folks, what does that stand for? Provincial Resource Center. <laughs> For the visually impaired? You got it. You got okay, it. Okay, <laughs> because I, I wasn't even sure because I don't, I, I overall have not in my life really needed too many, you know, assistive technologies, devices, or even large print. I also uh, learned Braille a little bit when I was in like elementary school, grade two, um, because we didn't at that point know where my vision was going to go. Uh, but, so it's kind of like a just in case measure. Mm -hmm. But after a couple of years, and this is a bit, I think about when my mom started learning it, she carried it on to a much, much higher level than I did. I think I probably, I'm not sure about then, but now for sure, I, I read it. I can read like basic Braille, but I do it visually, not tactilely with oh, my fingers. So you look at the bumps. I look at the bumps. Right. So I, I know most of my alphabet still, I know a little bit of punctuation and numbers and stuff like that, but I, you know, once we were like, okay, the vision and the retinas seem to be holding stable. You know, my mom mentioned that she had her second retina detachment at 16. Her first was, I think, at 11. Yeah. Um, and so we didn't really know what was going to happen with mine. So it was kind of like a, you know, a wait and see game. You know, if they don't snap before a certain point, they'll probably be fine. Right. So and thankfully they haven't. So so you when know. you were learning piano, Randy, you could just see regular music from a regular distance. And when you played the flute in the band, could you read? Mm -hmm. Probably not from a regular distance, you know, maybe like like a regular distance for me, what I would normally read, but that's still going to be closer than other folks. Um, I don't, you know, again, bearing in mind, this is when I was about four five and six and somewhere yeah. in that range. I don't remember what I was thinking at the time, but <laughs> I probably leaned in. 
you know, when I was reading it, because now my vision has not really gone, gotten any worse, like significantly worse over the years. So it's reasonably close to what it was then. And I would still now lean in if I was right. trying to play uh, for band class. I actually noticed this um, like later kind of watching videos of our concerts that um, I would, I mean, I knew what I was doing at the time, but I kind of didn't clue into the reasoning, I guess. I would, you know, uh, raise the music stand quite high and bring it as close to me basically as I could on my, on, you know, have the, yeah. uh, the tripod of the stand kind of between my feet in a way. Um, so, and then I probably still leaned in a bit. I definitely did. And um, I also at the time probably could have asked it to be enlarged somewhat just with the school photocopier, but I also didn't really think about it. But <laughs> watching videos of the concerts after you can see everyone else's faces except for mine because <laughs> higher than everybody else you know no one ever yeah. said anything but otherwise uh, i figured it would be better to be upright and playing it with it in my face than bending over playing in my face yeah i had yeah. i played the flute too and i had to share usually like oh, one yeah, one you know, one set of music between two of us and my friend who played the flute beside me was constantly telling me I was hogging the stand, but I was like, <laughs> you know, pulling it I over in front of me. <laughs> no, I, yeah, thankfully in classes, we, I don't think we ever did, or at least I never did. And um, I played for, for reference. I started in school when I was in school in grade six and I carried it all the way till I graduated in grade 12. So I guess that's six full years, maybe mm -hmm. seven, depending on how you look at it. Um, and I do still uh, play on occasion. The occasions are fewer and farther between than they used to be, but I did bring the flute and all the music I had with me when I moved from 100 mile house down to Vancouver after graduation. And I, on, on that note, uh, also as reference, I am from a fairly small town of roughly 2,000 people called 100 Mile House, British Columbia, Canada. And so some of these things you guys were talking about, Sean was saying in the jazz choir and Nika was in uh, so many choirs. <laughs> um, we had one band class between multiple grades, you know, one junior high class, one high school class. And, and there was no choirs except for one year, the band teacher that year who only worked there that year, uh, was did like a lunchtime every Tuesday program. So that was nice, had that experience. But, you know, I've always enjoyed singing. And as a fairly young, there was this like kind of singing lesson, children's choir type thing called Turtle Doves. So I guess I got a bit of instruction <laughs> that way. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I remember that was there's, the still best. A couple of songs. <laughs> there's still a couple of songs I remember parts of. Yeah, funnily enough cool. <laughs> um but my point with all of this is that like i mean one i'm a little bit jealous of all of you guys of like you know i have cousins who also grew up in the lower mainland and they were like in like four bands and two choirs and a marching band i'm like why i want that you know <laughs> so it's it's you know i only learned basic basic piano really um and you know several years of flute and then mm -hmm you know, in more recent years, I've dabbled in a couple of things, but I, I not really enough to even say I play them <laughs> properly yet. Um, I'm just curious, uh, Lori, did you have to do sight reading in like part of the Royal Conservatory exams is you have to do this sight reading, which was awful for me. Oh, boy. Uh, and Nika, I'm like, did they provide that in Braille for you? And I, you know, they would just put this piece of music in front of you that you'd never seen before and you'd have to play it. And that was, I never did well. Like that was just super, super hard for me. I could not really follow and see it and play it at the same time. How was that for you guys? That part of the exam wasn't as hard for me as the ear tests. When oh really? Play, when the examiner would play something, and then you had to repeat exactly what he just played or she. Um, so I guess I, I managed the same old way I did every day of practice, and that was to lean in as best I could and and go for the gusto. But yeah, I found the sight reading was way easier than the ear test. Okay. For me, interestingly enough, they actually I was exempt from the sight singing uh. portion, and they just did an extended ear training for me. Okay. Um, which I was excited about it at the time, but now looking back, I would have really liked the opportunity to try sight singing. 
Yeah. Um, even, even though, like, because ear training was, um, is like easier for me. So I found it, it was kind of like an unfair advantage that I had to get a higher score just because it was something that I was used to. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually, I have a funny story about how I, uh, by accidentally insulted my conservatory adjudicator. Can I share that? <laughs> sure. Um, okay, so I get really, really nervous. And when every time I walk into an exam, I shake like a leaf. It is so obvious. And when I get nervous, I sometimes don't really think about what comes out of my mouth or what I say. So when I was doing my vocal exercises, I got to choose the starting note. And I said, oh, can I start from a C5, which means a fifth octave C on the piano? And she I guess was maybe surprised that I knew what that was or I'm not sure, but she said C5 as in like a very shocked way. And I interpreted as that she didn't know what that meant. So I said, oh, a C5 is a fifth octave C on the piano. If you're a royal conservatory adjudicator, you should really know what that means. Oh. And I'm like, oh no. Oh that no. Bad. Just Let's to give... Your- uh, background to any listeners who did not experience Royal Conservatory, mm. those adjudicators were serious. They, oh yes, you you were not cracking jokes with them. They would not smile. They, like it, they mm-hmm. were so so intimidating. I remember my mm-hmm. piano teacher telling me, "Just picture them, you know, in their underwear," which that doesn't work. I don't. <laughs> but to try not- to like relax and not be so intimidated, but it yeah, it didn't work. <laughs> Especially when you're in a big formal room, you know, it's a big room and there's you and the adjudicator and one or two pianos, perhaps in this case, if it was, you know, for us, Mm -hmm. it was piano, but, and you're young and naive and yeah, it's, it's, it's quite an intimidating experience. I don't know the answer for either or any of you, I guess, in this case, but how old were you guys? I was thinking specifically mom, but you know, all of you when you took like your first exams? I think I was probably eight or nine, maybe. Um, I don't remember exactly, but fairly young. Do you think it, you were, you know, like mom was just saying, like, you know, the this tent setting in the room and the oh, stu- yeah. adjudicators, they, do you think it got worse as you got older, you know, and more aware, I guess, as opposed to like a kid, like you might be nervous, but maybe you don't care? No, I was always very nervous. There's a lot of pressure because the exams only happen twice a year. Mm -hmm. So you have to like apply for it well in advance and you're working towards it. You have to know all these pieces. There's so many different components to it. Um, it, I don't know. It's just, it's very, very intimidating. I think especially when you're young, but then after so many years of going through it, you know how intimidating it is. (laughs) So no, it doesn't ever get better. It didn't really, no, it didn't. And maybe that's why I failed the last exam because, I mean, well, there's so much you have to do for grade 10, but, and I don't think I was truly ready, but yeah. It's but tough. your grade 10 in Royal Conservatory is your teaching degree. So for, for listeners, that's, that's quite a, an achievement. That's quite a level. Yeah, my teacher had jumped me from grade 8 to grade 10, and the goal was to do grade 10 when I graduated from high school. Like, I wanted to finish it all at the same time, and I totally wasn't ready, but it was just, as I can be a little stubborn sometimes, once I set my mind to something, uh, (laughs) I went ahead and did it anyway, and then, you know, didn't pass, but I quit at that point because I was done high school, so I was also done piano. Like, that was kind of my mentality at the time. Yeah. And you were off to other things. Yeah, off other adventures. Other things, you mm-hmm. know. And I'll tell oh, Randy, right. I was a little older, though, when I first did my first Royal Conservatory. So I think I was like a young teenager, 12, 13 and up. So basically all my exams occurred between 12 and 16. And because when I took my additional theory, it was from a different teacher when I was into the higher theory, the rudiments. Uh, with the Royal Conservatory, I had to, you know, give up a Saturday morning even to go do classes in that regard. So it was still intimidating, but I didn't start out as young as Sean in this case, like eight years old. It was, like I said, I was, I guess they call them tweens now. So it was about a mm-hmm. tween or something. Yeah. I was pretty late starting Royal Conservatory of Music because I did my first exam at 14. And I think I started taking lessons at age 11. 
Um, and the reason why it took me three years was because I wanted to skip the first few levels just because like saving money, you know, they're mm -hmm. pretty expensive. And as a vocalist, you also have to pay for your accompanist, your pianist and oh. all of the rehearsals they do with you. So I did my, I only did my levels four and five just because then I kind of got busy. I would like to go back, but. So Lori, you taught your kids piano. Um, I also taught piano a little bit in the later high school years, just to beginners. And I had to do it sort of a, a little bit of a unique way. Like I had, they had a copy of their book and I had a copy of their book that I could follow along separately. Um, you know, I made flashcards so that I, on the back of the card could write really largely what letter that was when trying to teach them the notes and stuff like that. Did you have to do anything special to teach your kids? No, not to that degree. I think from what you're saying is, is that you sounds like your vision was a little bit worse at the level or at the time you were teaching than when I was teaching my kids. But I would definitely stop them if if, if it sounded wrong. And, and for somebody that spoke already several times about not having a good ear for music, I could, <laughs> for, for the most part, in the primary uh, levels, could tell if they hit a wrong note and I'd have them stop. I'd lean in. We'd look at it together. Um uh, you know, so I think what I did is really is just managed to squeeze those lessons in for my children before my vision started to take more leaps and bounds in, in diminishing. Um, you know, I, I, what we learn over time is that, you know, growing up 10% of vision, seeing, you know, it sucked if you want to get blunt, right? But, oh my goodness, if I had 10% now, I'd think I was fully sighted, you know, it's, it's, so mm -hmm. it's, you know, at 5% vision, maybe I had about 5% vision when I taught my kids. Well, that seemed adequate at the time for the levels I was teaching them. I'm not sure, Sean, how far I could have gone without adding some sort of tools and other resources and angles in teaching them. Yeah, it's, you know, these, again, talking primary um, at, mm -hmm. that, at that point. So. so maybe it's a good thing we both ended up quitting <laughs> before we got too complicated. <laughs> well, you know, maybe so. It was interesting in a sense, if you don't mind me telling just a little story here, because when I, I didn't know that I wanted to take piano lessons a as a child. I had never spoke of it. I had never thought of it. I mean, I was um, born and raised in Langley, and we lived on land, and, and you know, outdoors was the place to be, and I had five siblings, and, and you know, and nobody else was taking music lessons and and one day my mom comes home uh, we're after school I'm home or she had been out and she comes home and she says to me would you like to take piano lessons remember she's talking to a six-year-old would you like to take piano lessons and before I could answer she'd say okay here good here's your books and your two dollars and on Saturday you're going down the road and you're <laughs> going to go to the such and such a house and you're going to start your lessons we didn't even own a piano I thought, oh, okay. And every day you're going to come home and you're going to go up the block to Auntie Kay's house, just a, a close family friend that we got to know. And they became aunt and uncle. And you're going to go there every day and practice for half an hour. And, um, and, and you know, life is it's beautiful. I said, okay, well, fine. Uh, unlike today's day and age, I mean, even when my kids were young, you know, 25 to 30 years ago, I wouldn't have been sending them off to no lesson by themselves like that out in the country a mile down the road, but this is what we did. So I did that. <laughs> and every day I would come home after school and I would have to literally, you know, come drop my stuff out of my house, can leave and go down the street to the neighbor's house, which I guess is probably about two equal to two city blocks. Their whole family of children would have to wait to do anything in that house, couldn't watch TV or anything, till Lori came over, <laughs> practiced for a half an hour, and left. Oh, wow. Well, <laughs> as a youngster, so, so I'd do all my songs. You know, we had five, six books. It was Leela Fletcher and Thompson and, yes, you know, the World Concert, you know, all those yeah. guys. Yeah. And I'd go through all my books, and I would say, is, five, is, is half an hour over yet? And Auntie Kay would say, no, it's not. And I'd play, play them all again. Is, five, is, is half an hour over yet? And she'd say, no, it's not yet. And that probably took me only five minutes to go through all my songs, you know? So you imagine how many times I must have said that or asked that. And then I would go home. But never was I allowed to go play first. Never was I allowed to bring a friend home. You know, once I oh. remember doing that, my mom said, sorry. Mom, there's a new girl at school. No, nope, sorry. You're going to have to see her another day. You have to go. And I think again, I got five siblings and none of them had to do this. And I don't know, I'm starting to think, 
what have I done wrong? Why why am I being punished? I, I don't understand this. <laughs> And, and and I had to do that for two years, every day, go down to the neighbors and practice until one day, I guess, one of my sets of grandparents uh, managed to, within the family, um, purchase a used piano for, for me. And it's... Um, and so then I was allowed to do this every day at my own house, but it still became before anything. It, it The practice became first. You did do nothing else. So that half hour became like eternity. And uh-huh. then when you got older into the conservatory, it was an hour practice. Yes. Oh, yeah. And then when I had a part-time job as a teenager and I didn't get off work till nine o'clock, I still had to come home and practice from till 10 o'clock at night. Wow. But But having said that, I later learned in life that my mother... Um, we, my father was totally blind. When I was two years old, he lost his sight. So he is about 29 years old and has four children mm. and lost his livelihood. And that set my mother into thinking ahead. And again, you're, you're talking 60s and 70s at this time. So we're talking, mm-hmm. you know, a different era altogether. And my mother felt she was preparing me for employment, that What can this girl do if she goes blind? What can my daughter do? How can I help my daughter prepare for the future if she goes blind? And she was determined that I could teach piano. And so, I mean, in the long run, you got to thank her for doing what she did. However, I I say that I'm sorry, Mom, I I disappointed you because I'm no concert pianist. (laughs) And um, I'm not teaching piano but it did lead me into teaching my children. And out of all the things that I said, I would never force my children to participate in soccer, this or that, you know, I would only support their own interests. I did explain to them that I felt it was very, very important to learn the language of music. And especially when my, both my children had talked about wanting to know other languages. And so I taught them that music is a language, that Braille was a language for, for Randy's sake. They both went into French immersion and et cetera, et cetera. So, I asked them, or I said to them, I feel, first of all, that I have this ability, this skill that my parents invested in me, and no, I'm not a a concert pianist, but I have the knowledge, and therefore, I feel I should transfer that knowledge on to to my children, and I told them that they, as Randy alluded to already, that they had to only go to a certain level. And it was mainly, it wasn't even so much that they played the instruments. I wanted them to be able to read the music, read the language. So they did have to do the Leela Fletcher theory papers, oh. grade one to three, <laughs> and complete oh, those. So many nightmares. <laughs> Doesn't it? And, um, and, and as when Randy alluded to, to practicing, she, does, I, she did not get forced to practice every day like I was, like it was very rigid No, for me. definitely not. Um, and, and I really didn't, and, yeah, I didn't enforce a lot of the, 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 the real discipline practice, I did enforce the theory assignments being completed and made sure they got their stars and on their pages and that sort of thing. So that's how I, that was sort of my philosophy. And I said, and you don't have to take it past a certain point if you don't want to. So in other words, if you want to get this over with, hurry up and get your theory papers finished, grade one, two, three, and we'll be done. <laughs> well, and as I said earlier, too, um, you know, in as the child at the time, I wasn't exactly thrilled with practicing i think i you know i think this might be true with a lot of things you you do want the end result but just maybe not the process at that age right um and now actually as an adult in my mid-20s i i kind of regret it a little bit that i didn't you know maybe take it a little further learn a bit more because i uh as far as playing goes and and i think to some degree reading music too because i don't you know I'm much better reading the bass or the treble clef than the bass clef, but I, I didn't really ever play with both hands simultaneously. I, it was mostly well, right-handed melody, you know, that was fine. Um, and then, you know, and then I stopped for several years. And then at some point as a teenager, I did start like, you know, plunking out, playing a little bit, teaching myself a little bit based on, you know, listening to my mom play. Um, specifically in this case, uh, for Elise, you know, almost mm-hmm. everyone knows for that. Elise, that yeah. Classic. Yeah. And I, I got through like, I guess the main chunk of melody just by playing it, you know, matching it with by ear to go, does that sound right? Does that sound right? You know, I, I do not have a natural, I guess I kind of, I can play by ear in a sense of 
matching it up, but I do not have like perfect pitch or I can't tell you, Oh, that's a C over there. That's being played. Mm -hmm. You know, I could, I could go through the scale and land on it and go, ha, that's it. But you know, and so I got through a good chunk of it, just right-handed treble clef melody, uh, just, you know, through trial and error basically. And then eventually did wanted to actually be able to play it uh, and asked mom where her music book was and it was in the piano bench and I actually learned the bass clef on that too and it's to this day probably the only song I can fully play with both hands with one caveat that it's I don't know if there's multiple versions of this maybe but like there's yeah. a version that's very fancy like there's this whole yeah. fancy do 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 at the end I, I, it was not that version <laughs> it was the very basic version but it was both hands so I'm still kind of proud of that I kind of wish I could play better you know I have several friends I grew up with as well you know it, it, we were in we were in French immersion together because I we started in kindergarten all the way through to grade 12 in French immersion and that was you know my parents started my brother and I both in that when we went into school kind of again on it's a skill for your future you know you can speak another language it, in our case because we're broadcasting from Canada here it's our second national language and you know it can be useful in your future and you know the option was always given when we got to high school if you really hate it that much you can drop it um but my mentality at that point was I've done this many years I need something to show for it get me my certificate (laughs) Mm -hmm. that did pay off in the future when I wanted to go learn the flute which luckily is in the same key as the piano whereas a lot of mm-hmm. instruments are are in different keys the sheet music is different you know it's not the same notes to play the same thing and so I already knew that whole key or at least understood how to read it um and so all I had to you know not all I had to learn but I had to, I could concentrate on the learning of the the fingerings and the playing of the flute as opposed to the what is this thing and how do I play it? It was just, how do I play it? Yeah. Yeah. And learn. And by that time you'd learned, you know, the difference between a chord and note, an eighth note, a whole note and, you know, all some of that stuff. Yeah. I had all those, yeah. Had all those basics in there. So I like, I could read music at that point. I just wasn't the, you know, fantastic piano player or even a good one, (laughs) but yeah. And then, you know, that I was, you know, paid off. I, like I said, I did several years of flute in band. And I really enjoyed it. I mean, it's not, I wouldn't call it a useful skill in the sense of uh, it will never bring me employment at the level I'm at. And I'm certainly not going to be the, you know, let's have a sing along around the campfire instrumentalist. <laughs> you don't do but may I you. throw in this point, because it's very valuable in my opinion, that despite what I think what we all end up with as musicians or not, um, I do strongly believe that every child on this planet should be introduced to music, should be introduced to learning through music, because it will enhance their education in all other areas, whether it's especially mathematics. I think mm-hmm. music has, and yeah. I think Nika would probably really relate. There's a real good correlation between music and, and at least the theory and, and, and mathematics. Um, you're just it, it just enhances your reading skills. Um, and I'm not talking just music here, but just reading uh, literacy skills, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, it just plays a huge role in the foundation of who we all are and, and where we will learn. And, and I can compare that to even my siblings, my nieces and nephews, and that, that haven't had music training. And, and, and in fact, yeah, who str- they struggled more um, as a result. And there's, there's, you know, we don't have the time or, or I don't have the facts, scientific facts here to present, but there definitely is that correlation of, of music enhances um, our knowledge and our and it helps, I guess, our, uh, you know, our intelligence work better. I, I don't know, again, I don't have the right yeah. way to say it, but no, it, I it's think really invaluable. The discipline also of having to practice every day, because I had the same, you did your homework, then you practice piano, and then you could watch TV or play with friends. And I think it teaches you a work ethic as well, right? It's like you're, I mean, my parents, they're like spending their hard earned money on these lessons. You better not be wasting it by not following through and doing the work. 
and I'm glad you touched on that, Sean, because I have to say too, yeah, that that the, the, the dis, my self discipline as a result, I might not be a, a concert pianist, but I learned so much else from that structure, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, I, I have to say yeah, that that discipline. I mean, it's actually sometimes it's a curse, but. Mm-hmm. Um, because we're too disciplined in some ways, but that structure taught me so much as well. And that is evident too amongst my siblings and the, the comparison between, you know, the difference that they didn't have it for the reasons uh, we grew up um, after my father lost his job. You can appreciate that um, financially we were set back a little for quite some time. And so, as you just also alluded to, Sean, is it was an honor you know, I was the chosen one out of all the children that my mm-hmm. parents could afford this. And then $2 doesn't sound like much now, but I can't imagine what lessons cost these days are probably $30, $40, $50 an hour. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. But um, that $2 was huge. You might as well have made it $200 today. And yeah, I had the respect for that effort being put, being put towards me and, you know, the music books weren't cheap and, um, and exams eventually cost money, and yeah. So again, it, it the discipline you 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 did it. I, I guess I was responsible enough, and and recognized, and had enough respect, and, and understood the sacrifices that my parents were actually making for me to have a future. Yeah, yeah. And like for me, like it's worth every penny. Like, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. wouldn't do anything differently. So yeah, would you really guys good. have? advice for parents who are raising a child with a visual impairment that wants to learn an instrument, take music lessons? I think uh, it's not like technical advice, but a key concept to hold on to is that if your child really wants something, there is a way to help them and support them to be able to do it. Especially nowadays, there are I mean, I I see ads on, you know, this might not help a visually impaired family, but I see ads on YouTube all the time for use an app to play piano. And I'm almost offended by it, you know, Mm. and like, I certainly didn't take years and years of exams and stuff. And, and I'm just like, no, you learn, you learn on a piano. What do you mean you use an app now? You know? Um, But, you know, for anyone who's visually impaired, I'm sure there are also a lot more, well, I hope at least a lot more resources and technologies available now to help with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'd say this is something that applies to anything like sports, dance, music lessons. And it's that I think it might be hard to find someone at first, just because, you know, not everyone is lucky enough to just happen to know a blind piano teacher. But I think after searching, you will always be able to find someone who is willing to teach your child. And there's always like where there's a will, there's a way and there's always a solution. Yeah, I think a a teacher who's creative, who's willing to explore different ways, maybe it's not the same formula they use with every other student, but they're willing to kind of try different things. And I know my teacher, patience, like, giving me one bar at a time in your right hand, your, your, you know, your right hand is playing a C and a G and in the left hand, you're playing a C and an E and then that's a quarter note. And then you're going to move to, you know, like literally note by note, talked me through one bar at a time. <laughs> like that is tedious. So yeah, that's I think quite yeah. amazing. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think the three of you summed it up pretty good, actually. And I think, you know, what Randy was going to say, or what Randy did say, and that's why I was suggesting Nika go first, because, yeah, I, I didn't really have any technical type advice. But um, again, c- combined, you've all summed it up really well. I think that the bottom line is, is um, you know, that famous saying where there's a will, there's a way. And we in the, the low vision community know that there's an alternate format to doing almost anything and everything we want to do. Doesn't mean it's going to be rated right our fingertips. Um, but as you described, Sean, um, a teacher that's willing to learn along with us. So you, um, similarly to when Randy and I took karate lessons together for twice a week for two years. And um, I mean, it was like, me the adult in with the kids class kind of thing there and um but i was able to help teach the instructor our sensei that what what i needed from him to you know verbally describe some of the moves or have him come over and be um actually hands-on and put my arm in the right position or put my 
you know, leg or tell me how to do it. So I think the same could be done with a music teacher. As you said, if, as long as somebody's willing, um, we can help teach them. We've been focusing on, on, you know, advice for parents of children specifically. Um, but I also think it's important to point out that it's never too late to learn an instrument. I mean, it, it might be harder as an adult and the further along you get, it might get harder, but it's possible. So, you know, don't be intimidated if you're a visually impaired adult who is just like, I decided I want to learn this instrument, now what? You know, um, I think all the same things we said apply, but just that like, you know, it might be harder or, or specifically more intimidating as an adult to start these things than if you're a kid and maybe don't, you know, know better or, you know, your parents are managing it or, what have you. And um, I think, you know, I've tried to learn a couple of other instruments on a casual basis as an adult. Um, I think, well, lots of people I know actually have done that. And uh, especially now as we're in pandemic, people are finding things to occupy their times, be it languages or instruments, I think are both very popular right now. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know. Yeah, no, I want to learn the ukulele. That's my next thing. Oh, it's so Gotta... much fun. The ukulele is so much fun. I it, love it. It seems like a little bit more portable and easy than the guitar, I'm hoping. Yeah, like I'm <laughs> learning, when I'm trying to teach myself both, the ukulele is so much easier. It doesn't hurt my fingers. And then every time I practice my guitar, like I get blisters. Yes, totally. It kills my hands. Yeah. Well, I think that's, you know, practice. <laughs> yeah. until, you got to develop calluses. those calluses, but yeah. it takes a yeah. long time and it's painful. And process. you have to like stretch more with the guitar if you have like tiny little baby doll hands. Right. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for being here. This has been very interesting and hopefully helpful to people who are listening. And, and rah, rah, yay music. Like, definitely, I agree. Make it part of your life somehow because I think it is really important and and beneficial. Yes, and I'd just like to say, Randy, I think that was a really good point that you brought up about, you know, doesn't matter if, if you're an adult, it doesn't, you know, like you said, we were talking about children, but, um, you know, absolutely as an adult, because I was going to say that to you moments ago when you said something about yourself, I was going to say, it's never too late. You could still pick up the piano and carry on. <laughs> so... And maybe I will just, it's not, <laughs> it, it probably won't be this pandemic. That's all. No. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I think we should wrap up. Thank you so much to Lori for joining us. Well, thanks and, for having me. Yeah, and thanks, Randy and Nika, for co-hosting with me today. Not a problem. Always enjoy it. Yes, so excited for this episode. I love it. This is Limitless, the Blind Beginnings podcast. I'm your host, Sean Marsley, and please join us again. For more information on Blind Beginnings and its mission to inspire and support children and youth who are blind or partially sighted and their families, visit www.blindbeginnings.ca.